David, when you were first presenting the idea of a college for this region, I'd be interested in how people received that, um, you know, on all sides of the coin, good, bad, and otherwise. Would you tell us a little bit who were your original champions? Well, I think one of the things we did right, we did some things right and we did some things not so right, but one of the things we did right was to contact the National Association of Junior Colleges and ask them what material they had that we could present to the people of the district about a junior college. And they sent us, back in those days, no PowerPoints, no computers, none of that stuff. They sent us a slideshow and a little video presentation. And uh, we took that around. To form the district, we had to get five contiguous counties. And uh, they had to have 400 graduating seniors, a $60 million tax base, which seems ridiculous today. But back then, that was a lot of money. And in order to get that tax base, we really had to include Climax Molybdenum Company because they were the big player. There was no veil. Uh, Aspen was just getting off the ground with Walter Papke at that time. And to, to get the five contiguous counties, we had to include Lake County with Leadville. So uh, when we got those all put together and Climax agreed to do it, if they could have a campus and a mining program up there, uh, then they would come in. So that's why we started with the dual campus here in Spring Valley and up there in Leadville. And then we had to travel through those five counties that we had put together and uh, sell it. And we did receive, we did receive uh, good reception because if you take a product on the road and actually meet the people, we went to the Ko Kiwanis clubs, PTAs, um, uh, chambers of Commerce, anybody we could talk to anywhere and show them actually what it is and the possibility of them having a place for their young people to come at a reasonable cost to get their first two years of college or get a technical degree. It got a good reception. Most people said that would be, be, be great. Had a little problem up there with uh, Summit County because they were way off on the edge there in Breckenridge and they actually never voted for it when we had the vote. They had to come in kicking and screaming because the other f four counties voted for it. Now they've got a nice facility. <laughs> yes, we might mention that Summit County voted no and now has two campuses, right, David? <laughs> you Summit Countyers out there. Um, I do want to say, before I um, ask a question to another one of our panelists, I do want to recognize Ann Delaplane, who's here with David today. Uh, Ann is David's bride. Um, and if uh, starting a college wasn't enough, they are also the parents of eight sons. Wow. So now, speaking of champions, uh, if we can turn to our landowners and our incredible champions as well. Jim, um, in addition to the great horse, <laughs> I understand that about this time, you were a young man in your first years of marriage, living and working on a ranch up in Spring Valley here, and then one clear moment stands out to you as how you got involved in the college. Would you please tell us about that? Well, uh, <clears throat> the first time I heard about the college was uh, when uh, Mary Ann's uncle, Jim Quigley, rode in on his horse, and I was in the milk bar. So uh, <clears throat> Jim says, uh, what do you think if we give some land and, and we'll have a college up here? And I'm thinking, you know, maybe Jim's got a loose screw again. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, it went on and on, and, uh, and I thought, you know, this thing's going to fizzle out. It ain't going to happen. And so Jim's a pretty determined guy. You know, he was an old uh, rancher all of his life, and he, he never give up on anything. So uh, <clears throat> it went on and on, and, I, and it just kept developing and developing, and pretty soon, by golly, it happened. And here we are today, and what a great place this is. So, Jim, I'll have you uh, pass the, the mic to your bride. 
Um, so you, Sharon, you and Jim were newlyweds with a young family and a ranch that was your livelihood. Uh, to donate your land was a pretty big ask, certainly at that time. Um, what were the conversations like <laughs> over the dinner table? And did you say yes right away? No way. <laughs> <laughs> um, we discussed it some, and re remembering back 50-some years ago, it was kind of hard to remember exactly what we said. <laughs> but <laughs> we were skeptical. You know, we just couldn't believe with the remoteness of the land up here that it could ever happen. And then the more the neighbors talked and the group that was putting this package together talked, the more it seemed feasible. And so here we are, one of the best assets we could have to the community of Glenwood Springs. And as a result, to many other mountain communities as well, right? It starts with an idea. So that Mr. Quigley, who rode up on his horse and first talked to the Nislonics about that, happened to be your uncle, Marianne. Marianne and I had coffee recently. I learned something every single time I visit with her. But he and your father were instrumental in convening all of the multiple families um, up in this area into gifting what ended up being this absolutely exceptional, amazing, beautiful, gorgeous, 800 acres from all of the ranchers combined. You and your sisters were kids back then. All of a sudden, there were college kids in what had been your quiet backyard. <laughs> what was that like? And did you have much interaction with the college as your neighbors? Yes, I did. I had just graduated from high school, and um, it was like an awesome thing to have somebody down the road instead of nobody driving down the road. And um, I was here the very first day, the very first year, which doesn't seem like 50 years ago, I can tell you that. But um, I've been passionate about CMC for 50 years and worked here for 25, the first 25 years. So Jim, there's a saying, never look a gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> But in fact, the town wasn't sold on your original offer of land, and there was quite a conversation about where the campus would end up. And I recall in my conversations with David that there was a little spot where a target exists right now in Glenwood Springs, and that had been, uh, it had been advised that you not go there, right? The college not go there, because it's a big, huge, shifting alluvial fan, um, geologically, and everything that sits on that cracks, right? Um, but it was in town. This was not in town, it's still not in town. So, so talk a little bit about what that took and what it really took to finally bring the college up to this spectacular place. Well, there was a, a chunk of property up on Four Mile called the old, uh, the old Martino Ranch that uh, a, a fella purchased and uh, he was gonna give that land to the for the college at the price that he paid for it. So uh, <clears throat> Jim uh, Quigley, uh, at that time we had agreed to each give 40 acres. There was, uh, there was five ranchers, five that kind of cornered right here. And we were, <clears throat> we were going to give, uh, like in our part, we were going to give 40 acres. Well, Jim Quigley says, maybe we ought to up the ante a little bit. See, 40 acres would have made about 400 acres. Anyway, so Jim says, well, let's, let's up the ante on the land and, and, uh, and make it 800 acres. So uh, anyway, we, we did, and uh, it, went, it went better for us to have it up here. And I think in the, in the long run, it's, it's better off up here now than it would have been in the other places that they first uh, were going to put it. It's great. It's great knowledge for us. So, da so David, you might have a perspective on this as well. Would you share that with us? I'm really glad for this opportunity because the most difficult decision that there, it was called the governing committee then, they're trustees now, aren't they? The, the most difficult 
decision the governing committee made was a site decision. The people in the town were very, very desirable for it to be down there. And even though we were offered the Union Oil Land, which is where the Target store and all the mall and all that stuff is now, off of Red Mountain, uh, it was determined by geologists that it was an alluvial fan, it was unstable, so we made a decision not to go there. And people are telling me the buildings are cracking there now. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, then the Martino thing came up and we began to work on that. I, being the Glenwood representative, did everything I possibly could to keep it away from Spring Valley. Uh, and, <laughs> and this probably resulted in some tension between me and <laughs> these, these ranchers. And, you know, it, it was a very, very hard decision. And the, the rest of the governing committee was looking at me as the rent, Glenwood representative. I held out as long as I could. I knew if I decided on Spring Valley, there would be a lot of heat from the town. But at the end, I knew the unity of the governing committee and the beauty of this site, it had to be. And we finally, after back and forth, we, we voted for it and then voted against it because of me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then back and voted for it. It was the most difficult, and I took a lot of heat from the town for it. It was the most difficult, but the best decision I ever made. 2020 hindsight can tell you that. And I wanted to say that this gift was a phenomenal gift. Can you imagine giving 800 acres of this beautiful land to create one of the most beautiful educational sites in the country? And so it was right, and you were right all along, and I want to say that now. <laughs> and I think... <laughs> <laughs> And, and I think that probably they deserve another standing ovation for this phenomenal gift. It, it's taken me 50 years to make that apology, <laughs> Jim and Marianne. Could I, could, I, could I say one you, thing? There's a retort in there. I can just hear it. Go ahead, Jim. David, uh, you know I'm beginning to like you just a little bit. <laughs> Time is an amazing thing, isn't it? So one more question to David before I open it up. Um, uh, in the first year, the college struggled didn't meet enrollment projections, um, and it looked like the college might not survive. Um, what did you do and what did the other trustees do to make sh the fact that all of us are in the room today possible? Well, you know, a fledgling child sometimes has its problems, and certainly that first year was among them. But the, the, the best thing that happened was that not only did the people of the district vote for the college, they voted to tax themselves, and they voted for a mill levy. And after a decision is made, whether they liked it or not, whether they voted for it or not, they all tax themselves to create the district, and once they bought into something, they want to protect it. And I don't think there was any way that anybody in this district was going to let that die because they were paying the bill for it, and they were going to do everything they could to make it go. And they did. I mean, they, they everybody came together and uh, tried to help in enrollments. Fortunately, we didn't have to rely totally on tuition, and that helped. And that's how we were able to survive. You know, and I'll just, I'll just add a, a little audible moment here, and that is that um, we've had trustees and governing boards over the years who have um, avoided the pressure to uh, become something different, and that would be a state institution. Um, and thinking that that might be a safe way to go for funding. And I think we all know that the gift that happened 50 plus years ago in creating this institution and the fact that our communities continue to support us the way they do means that all of us are stewards of our shareholders. Certainly, 
some of the largest shareholders we have on this stage and to return on the investment you've made in us and our communities have made in us. And we do that by virtue of the example we've just seen over the past weekend and tomorrow evening and all the graduates that walk across the stage. So we are so genuinely, absolutely grateful and thankful for all that you have done. So as you look back, I'll, I'll sort of um, maybe end on this, and, and, and one other moment I will say is, you know, Steamboat Springs, Route County, um, has its own story. We don't want to forget that. Um, it was a five-county district originally, and the Steamboat Springs School District um, and, and, and part of Route County is part of our family now, too. I have my conscience sitting here in the front row. And it is equally as impressive and, and lots of very similar components to the story um, in one woman, Lucy Bogue, who took it upon herself to have a higher education in Steamboat Springs and in essentially the northwest corner of Colorado, and did everything very sim very similar story to make sure that that happened. It was originally Yampa Valley College, but over the course of years, which we'll continue to try to celebrate over our 50th anniversary, to, to, to weave that story in, became a part of the college. And one of the things that I think is so spectacular and so amazing is that in both cases, our college was born out of a chamber of commerce. And we are absolutely connected to our workforce and our local economies. And were it not for the Glenwood Springs Chamber of Commerce when David was there and the Steamboat Springs Chamber of Commerce, neither of those enterprises and collectively now our enterprise certainly wouldn't exist. And we're certainly engaged in our chambers and other workforce partners uh, in all of our mountain communities now. Um, but we obviously also owe a great deal of thanks to folks who said, not what not I'm not letting this happen. I'm not letting this college die and look at us now It's absolutely incredible